Thank you, Lori. Good morning. Good, good to see you all again. It's good to see folks I haven't seen in a while. Good to welcome uh, new faces as well. But uh, wonderful that we can all gather uh, together this morning. Uh, just a few things uh, before we uh, before we start. Uh, uh, first, uh, you know, just. Uh, just quickly to uh, address the, uh, uh, the tragedy of uh, this past week uh, in Texas. Uh, I, I know our hearts can't understand that. How could they? Um, but uh, we continue to uh, trust uh, in the Lord, uh, in his sovereignty, uh, in his goodness, uh, his faithfulness, uh, in his love. Uh, we know uh, full well uh, that the Lord gathers near those who are uh, in deep need uh, and in need of comfort, rest, uh, peace, and uh, when we're uh, grieving, uh, I can't even imagine such grief, but uh, the Lord certainly draws uh, near uh, to those who need him. And uh, uh, as our hearts ache, I, I do trust that we'll continue to pray and lift our prayers up for those who are, are hurting and uh, in, in, in need. That's all. I mean, what can we do? Uh, and so we'll continue to do so. Um, we also want to acknowledge uh, uh, the observance of uh, Memorial Day uh, tomorrow. Uh, we certainly want to uh, remember uh, all the brave uh, men uh, and women who uh, sacrificed their very lives uh, for the freedom uh, that we partake in. Uh, even here this morning, the fact that we can gather together uh, like this, that we can worship, uh, is uh, due to those folks who've uh, given all. Uh, and so we're very grateful for that. We're also thankful for those uh, among the living uh, who've served in our nation's uh, armed forces, some here uh, today, and uh, thankful for that service. And we're certainly thankful for those who continue to serve uh, we deeply appreciate it. It does not go uh, unnoticed, and uh, certainly uh, we want to continue to remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shall. Um, also, uh, 
I wouldn't be a good dad if I didn't say that, you know, this is uh, Rachel's uh, last uh, Sunday with us. Um, I don't know what to say in regard to that. She's the last of our uh, uh, church children, really. Uh, we watched a number of them grow up, and uh, Rachel was the, uh, the last. Rachel's the last there. Uh, she'll graduate on uh, Friday. Uh, she won't be able to attend next Sunday. She'll be in another service to uh, receive a scholarship. But, um, uh, but you all, have, uh, many of you, have uh, watched her uh, grow up. And, uh, you know, I can think back to pictures of some of you just holding her as a, as a little one. And, uh, and now we get to see her go off. Uh, and so uh, thanks, Ed, for the prayers. Keep her in your mind as she uh, starts school. And uh, Hannah, too, uh, as she starts her uh, new job out there. The sisters will be together. Uh, keep them uh, in your hearts and in your prayers, I hope, as they uh, start these uh, new steps in their journey. It's amazing. Uh, so, all right. I think that's it. <laughs> but it's a lot. It's a lot. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we, uh, as we dive into the word this morning. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us together, Lord. Uh, thank you for being the unchangeable God. For us to know that your love is the same yesterday, today, and forever is just so much. To know that your power is the same. To know that your goodness and your mercy and your kindness is the same. Never changing. Uh, you know, I... It's just, it brings us encouragement, it brings us relief, it brings us comfort to know uh, that you're the same God. And uh, we're so thankful that your eyes are upon us this morning, uh, that you've met us here, you know where each of us are in our walk with you this morning, you know exactly the state of our hearts this morning, better than we do. And uh, we're just so thankful that your spirit's able to speak to us uh, where we are, uh, this morning, and uh, we look forward uh, to hearing what you have for us today. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Thank you uh, again for your spirit. Let, uh, let there be uh, an understanding, I pray, of your word today. Help me to be a clear messenger uh, of your word uh, today, I pray, and uh, may we all grow closer to you. We just want a we just want a nearer and deeper relationship with you, Lord. May glory and honor be yours and yours alone this day and, and all days. And uh, Lord, uh, certainly all that we've uh, spoken of uh, already this morning, uh, nothing escapes, <laughs> nothing escapes you, nothing is surprising to you. So we uh, trust that all, in all, uh, that your hand will be, uh, your hand will be upon it. And uh, we bring these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And uh, we're uh, in uh, Ezra this morning. Uh, if you haven't been in Ezra in a while, still in the Old Testament, hasn't moved. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, looking at uh, some verses there uh, in the ninth chapter uh, this morning. As we continue to talk about what we need, which is a, a restoration of the spirit and a revival of the heart. And uh, we're kind of looking at these uh, at those principles that are laid out in these Old Testament revivals. Uh, and, and it really just flows right into the New Testament and into the New Testament church and what we need uh, as believers. We need that re re restoring of the spirit, that revival of the heart. Um, so, last Sunday, uh, I mentioned that uh, while uh, biblical revivals are very different from one another, and they are, uh, there appears to be, in the Old Testament in particular, uh, some commonalities which precede each one. Uh, we said, first of all, that uh, each revival in the Old Testament seems to be preceded by some sort of moral or spiritual decline among the people of God. And then we said, secondly, that those Old Testament uh, revivals have always been preceded by some kind of righteous judgment uh, from God. And then thirdly, there's always a raising up of an immensely burdened leader or leaders 
And then lastly, after someone or a people are burdened by God, God's people engage in some sort of extraordinary action. Uh, and uh, that'll vary. And it does vary uh, from revival to revival. But the most common action taken was that of a gathering, that of an assembly. And it was during those assemblies, those gatherings, those congregations, that uh, God was going to uh, move to do something new. And that's exciting. That's exciting. So here uh, in the book of Ezra, uh, we find, and I'm not going to read the text initially. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, I need to to give you some background. We need to build up to it today. So I, I can't even dive into that immediately. But we'll, uh, we'll get there, I promise. Uh, but in the book of Ezra, we find that the people had been, if you're not familiar with it, they'd been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. This was a result of a judgment uh, upon their sins. But now they've come out of captivity. And much of their uh, Jewish faith during that time had been lost to them. They lost the word. They lost their Bible. Uh, they lost the Torah, the law that was found in the temple of God. And uh, they even lost their sacred language. Uh, you know, and there's an allusion to this in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, where we read that the law was uh, discovered and it was read. And Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people, Nehemiah 8, verse 8 says, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So the people had been absolutely drowned, just saturated in this pagan culture of Babylon. They'd lost their identity as God's people to such an extent that when uh, the prophet Haggai delivers God's prophecy. God actually speaks of his own chosen elect people as these people, not my people, these people. Uh, you know, it, it was as if God didn't recognize them because their identity had disappeared in Babylon. Um, so the consequence was that there was a, a, a famine in the law of God in the land. There was a famine in the word of God. And I would say that today, in a very real sense, absolutely, that we too, many people, our land, our country, suffers from a famine of the word of God. You know, there's many who just kind of lost the, the, the spirit of God's law and truth and the heart of the, the teachings of the word of God. There's a, there's a famine. A famine in the land, just like there was in Amos's day. Uh, you know, listen to this. There's a description that's found in Amos uh, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Amos chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. There was a spiritual decline, and it was tragic. That's what we read there. You know, there, and it's, it's not really any less tragic today. There's still a moral and spiritual decline in the world today. That's also tragic, and that's why, you know, we have to keep preaching the word of God, and we'll keep preaching the word of God, and it has to be done in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, right? You know, it's that Holy Ghost power. And uh, if we don't do that, if churches don't do that, the church universally, but if we don't do that as, as the body and we don't preach it, then people are going to be starving for the word. You know, there's just going to be that famine. And we don't want a starving in the church. That's the last place people should be starving for the word of God. Right? You know, there, so there was a spiritual decline among God's people in Ezra's day. Uh, but then we see that there was also a righteous judgment from God. Um, however, in this case, it was a, a, a restorative one. God wanted to bring his people back. And he wanted to bring them out of Babylon, and he wanted to bring them back to Judah. 
uh, but the heart of the people had to be renewed if any real blessing was to come, right? So we, we, we can't have restoration without renewal, right? We, we just can't have it. You know, we need it. And you can't have revival without renewal. You need that as well. We all want revival in our, our hearts. We all want a restoration of our spirits, a revival in our own hearts so we can continue on. But, you know, we, we have to be prepared uh, for that repentance that's necessary, right? That daily repentance, that inner renewal of the hearts, the deliverance that's needed in everything, in our homes, uh, in our schools, in our, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our churches, everywhere, everything. It, that work of cleansing that needs to be accomplished before God can renew. And so when Judah went into that Babylonian captivity, there were three stages uh, to that uh, deportation to Babylon. And so likewise, in their return to Judah, there were three stages of return to Jerusalem. And I'm going to take a few moments, and you'll see why. I hope you'll see why. If you don't see why, let me know later. You failed, Pastor Jim. There was a, right? So, but the, the first stage of that return was under Zerubbabel, who built the uh, temple. There was that rebuilding. Ezra chapter 3, if we were to go back, Ezra 3, verses 1 through 3, tells us that when the people assembled as one, in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel and the others built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifices. So for us, that speaks of our need as believers today for a true uh, heart relationship with God. So before there's going to be any sort of corporate revival of any way, each of us as Christians... You know, we need to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which the word of God says is our true and proper worship, right? So it's, it's setting up the altar before God, all right? And then we read in, in Ezra chapter 3, verse 10, that the builders laid the foundations of the temple of the Lord. Now, once Zerubbabel started lay, by laying the foundation and building the altar, the work of God was opposed. And we find in Ezra chapter 4 that the work was opposed by certain Samaritans, and God had to raise up two prophets, being Haggai and Zechariah. And through their preaching, the work was resumed. And so the children of Judah had only laid the foundations, and then they gave up to the opposition. Right? And it's so easy to surrender at times when the enemy comes. And I think that's the same in our own lives, too, when the enemy comes against us. Uh, sometimes we just want to give up. Sometimes we do. And just surrender. So in Ezra chapter 5, the work is resumed, and then the work is completed in Ezra chapter 6. I know I'm summarizing it for you. Please go back and read the chapters. Right? It's good stuff. I will tell you personally, if, you, if, you, if you're going to do a Bible study in the Old Testament, Ezra is an awesome place. Ezra and Nehemiah are fantastic studies. Just do it and you'll be, you'll be happy that you did. Anyway, the work is resumed, uh, Ezra chapter 5, the work completed in Ezra chapter 6. And then there's a second move of the people after Zerubbabel, and I will jump back to that in a moment. But uh, I want to quickly talk about the third so we have first Zerubbabel came into the land again, started rebuilding the temple. and then, But the third return of the people was under Nehemiah. And I uh, highly encourage you to read Nehemiah. It's, it's, well, it's awesome, really. That's, that's a favorite. Nehemiah constructed the walls of protection around that restored city. But this is an important principle that I want to emphasize uh, to y'all today. Uh, Ed, that, that's you. I'm saying y'all. That must come from... Anyway, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. I'm going to read from the Amplified. Proverbs 25, 28 says, Like a city that's broken down and without walls, leaving it unprotected, is a man who has no self-control over his spirit and sets himself up for trouble. So in other words, you, you have no spiritual protection. You might have the altar of God built 
You know, okay, such an altar might be erected. You might be worshiping God in some form of, of private temple in your heart, but what else? You need the protection. You have to have it. And there are certain gates through which the enemy gains entrance into our lives and into our homes and into our churches, God forbid, uh, but they're left open to the enemy. When Nehemiah rebuilt the uh, walls around Jerusalem, he started, from, he started from the gates and he built out, is what we find. And I, I find that highly instructive. You know, he started at the weak, the vulnerable places, and, and that, those are the places where the enemy could enter, and he built the protection around them. I mean, that, incredibly instructive. You know, so first the people returned to the land. Zerubbabel built the altar. He laid the foundations. They got discouraged. And Haggai and Zechariah had to come and preach them up again to building. And then thirdly, Nehemiah builds walls. But I told you I'd go back to the second. But the second return was under Ezra. Uh, you know, where we find ourselves today. There was no point in, in uh, you know, building walls of protection if God's people uh, weren't renewed in their hearts. And that's why God raised up Ezra. Uh, th that's exactly why. It, it's, all, it's okay, you're having an altar, that's, that's fine. It's all right having a foundation uh, and, and a temple and having all the rites and all the rituals, but the people of God needed to be renewed. They needed that renewal. So there was this terrible, tragic, spiritual decline, a righteous judgment from God, and there, there was the raising up of uh, immensely burdened leaders, and that's what we find. And there are several people, several people that God raised up for this time, for, for this hour in history. He raised up Zerubbabel, and he raised up Haggai, and, and Zechariah, and Nehemiah, and Joshua, and Malachi, and, and all of them had a, had a job to do in relation to the restoration of God's people in the land. And of course, we can't forget Esther, right? Uh, who wasn't used in the restoration, but in the preservation uh, of God's people. And her story fits between, in case you're interested, her story fits between uh, chapters 6 and 7 uh, uh, of Ezra. And that's a period of about 58 years. But wh what we really want to understand was this the whole idea is that God was imparting this vision to many people. I think that's really exciting. Uh, and and I, why would we not believe that God, you know, why can't God do that now? Same God. You know, God, I believe even today, he's imparting into the hearts of people a, a, a vision about something that he wants to do. You know, some new thing. You know, you, you find that whenever God wants to do something new again. And he does this. You know, God, God's new thing. He places that same vision. He places that same burden in different people's hearts all over the place. He reveals it. He reveals it. Ezra was a priest from the family of Aaron. And uh, apparently he requested permission from the king of Persia, realizing that the uh, remnant in the restored nation, they desperately needed uh, spiritual uh, guidance and instruction. The altar had been built, the foundation was laid, the temple was being erected, but there was something that was wrong with their hearts. And, you know, what, what do we read? It's a form of godliness without power. Uh, you know, so here was this man, thousands of miles away, and he had this burden. And Ezra's burden led to sacrifice. And that's, you know, that's always something that has to happen. It took Ezra four months, friends, to make the journey of nearly a thousand miles from Babylon to Jerusalem. And if God's going to call you to give you his burden for this time, there'll be some sort of sacrifice that's involved. Something. It's a great thing to be in that place. Absolutely. But as we keep reading in the word of God, it costs, and we have to be prepared for that. So here was this man who was burdened, and he was willing to pay a sacrifice, 
The Jews call him the second Moses. Uh, and it's a term that they, they gave to Ezra. If you look at Ezra uh, chapter 7, verse 10, we can see why. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, reading from, uh, reading from the Amplified again. For Ezra had set his heart, that is, he was resolved to study and interpret the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. And that reveals that Ezra was determined to be not just a preacher, but a man of the word. And, and, and that's incredible. If I, could, if I, as a preacher, if I, could be like, if I could be like Ezra, if I could just be someone who's resolved to know this book, right? You know, and, and not just a preacher, right? I mean, it, but to know the book and to obey the word and to teach it, well, I mean, that's something else, right? And that's just the case for all of us. You know, it, it's, you know it's believed by many scholars that, uh, that Ezra wrote the books of Chronicles. It's also believed that he organized the, the sacred writings of the Old Testament into the canon that we have now. Uh, it's also believed that it was Ezra who wrote Psalm 119 and Psalm 1. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, if he wrote that, it would be, of course, as the preface to the book of Psalms. Uh, many, I would say many biblical historians believe that it was Ezra who promoted that whole concept of the synagogue as a local way to teach the word of God to communities. We need us. We need a, a revival in a passion for the glory of God. And we also need that revival for the, you know, the the speaking, the preaching of the, the, the word of God. You know, uh, you know it's, it's something that the Holy Spirit does within us. It's that spirit-anointed preaching of the word of God. We, we need that impassioned desire to love and to obey God in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible then isn't so much a, a book to be explained, but it's to be believed and then after that to be obeyed, right? And so we continue in it. We want to, we want to know more. There's things that we can't explain in the Bible. How, how many times have I stood up here and said, I don't know, right? Many. And there'll be many more times because I don't. But we have to believe it and we have to obey it, right? And the reason is because God's given it to us. And we are thankful for it. Don't sound as bad as last week, do I? I think it's improving. These allergies will be good. Whew. So there was a, there was a moral and there was a there was a spiritual decline. There was a righteous judgment from God. There was an, uh, this raising up of an immensely burdened leader and leaders. Uh, and then after that, here it comes. Here comes the assembly. Here comes the gathering. Right? So Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. It says, uh, Ezra chapter 8, beginning verse 21. I'll repeat that for my friend back there. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. So there, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So before setting on that long journey to Jerusalem, we have Ezra, and he proclaimed this three-day fast by the river Ahava. And he was asking God's protection on their journey. He wanted God to be with them, right? And so he fasted, and he prayed. We talked a little bit about that last week. He was doing this to, you know, they were doing that, to humble themselves uh, before uh, the Lord, to humble themselves, to seek the Lord. Ezra knew that he needed God, so uh, assembling the returning exiles there at the Ahava Canal. Uh, by the way, Ahava means continual flow, and that uh, as New Testament believers, we, you know, what do we think of immediately? 
but that living river, right? That living water. You know, he knew he needed the river of God. Ezra understood this. If I don't know, but if Ezra was the actual author of the Chronicles, then he wrote these words uh, to God. Second, Chron Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Um, you know, it's just, again, it's just a question to our hearts if we, as God's people, if we humble ourselves enough to, to do that, to fast and to pray and to seek God's face in the assembly. Um, and we're a small gathering, I know that. Uh, but it is no, it is, I mean, great, great gatherings, small gatherings, we're still God's people and we're gathered together uh, in his name to worship him. And so it is absolutely applicable to us. Don't think for a moment that because we're small, uh, I mean, we're here, we're gathering. God sees us and he hears us. Uh, that is without question, without question. And, uh, you know, we need to do this as an assembly. We need to seek God's direction because the whole future witness of the church is at stake, right? We have to, we have to. Ezra chapter 8, verse 22 in Ezra 8, 22, Ezra was, was, he was ashamed to ask the king for earthly protection. He could have asked for, he could have actually asked for an armed escort if he wanted to, uh, but he had already told um, Artaxerxes that God's good hand was upon him and was upon the Jews, so he had to, he had to walk the talk. He had to. He had to trust in God's covenant and God's promises. He had to have that faith, right? So... I mean, we already know we need a revival of faith. It's just something we need within our hearts. Um, and, I mean, it's no less the case, you know, when we look, I mean, I think there's just tragedy upon tragedy in our world today. We need a revival of faith. We need to, we want to keep going with him, but we need to believe. We need to, we need to keep on going. Anyway, God has been with them on their journey. And so, you're like, Finally, we reach our text this morning. I told you, just, just, you hang tight, you get there. Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. I'm not going to read through, but we'll, let's, we'll look at a few verses through that text this morning. Look at every, think about everything that's led up to here, this moment. They're in Jerusalem. And, and the first thing Ezra did when he heard, and there's a compromise that's going on. Here, you know, of the Jews, um, of God's people. And the first thing he does is goes to the temple, sits on the ground, and he expresses his grief before the Lord. He, it, it, we're even told that he pulls the hair uh, out of his head, you know, which is terrifying to someone like myself who has so little hair. Already, you know, but this is what it was. I mean, it was that act of, of grief. He's pulling the hair out from his head. He's pulling the hair out from his beard. And he tore his, his tunic and his, his cloak. You know, we've seen this before among God's people. Ezra chapter 9 verse 3 says that he sat there appalled. Uh, and that word in Hebrew means he, he sat shocked. He sat, he sat horrified, desolate. Um, so Ezra was broken before the sins of God's people, and uh, then something actually quite interesting happened. Uh, something that I, I really believe that God's doing, that God wants to do today. You know, uh, during this time of Ezra's fasting and mourning, what we find is that this crowd gathers around him, right? Right? And, and who, who are they? Well, look at verse 4 of Ezra chapter 9. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. Now, when God gave the law uh, to, to Israel through Moses back on Mount Sinai, you know, we read that the people trembled. That was a long time ago. Right? They hadn't been trembling since. But now... 
you know, God's word is delivered in the power of the spirit and it's convicting them. And what do we find? They gather and they start to tremble. It's incredible. You know, and we read the Lord's words in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2. Isaiah 66, 2. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. So Ezra, he sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice and, well, you know, we, we might wonder why he chose the hour of the, the evening uh, sacrifice to start his prayer and his confession in the hearing of Israel. Uh, I, I would think that he absolutely had that eye of faith, you know, from the sacrificial lamb that would make the atonement for uh, God's, you know, uh, for the people's sins. Uh, you remember Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's intercessory prayer, awesome, great intercessory prayer. It was that same prayer was at the evening sacrifice as well. And, and so, you know, maybe Ezra was doing exactly what Daniel was doing and really what every intercessor of God does, uh, which is like Aaron, the high priest on the day of atonement, they're placing their hands on the head of the scapegoat, they're confessing Israel's sins and they're releasing it uh, into the wild, just like we read in uh, Leviticus chapter 16. So anyway, that, that's what we as God's people, you and I, need to do uh, in our brokenness and in our burden. We always want to come to Calvary again, every time. We need to confess our sins, we need to agree with God that we've gone the wrong way, and we do. You know, and we need to repent, and we need to renounce, and we need to confess, you know, we need to forsake. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So Ezra's prayer... Um, can I give you more reading to do? Ezra's prayer, if you were to compare it with Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, you could do that. You can go back and read it. And Nehemiah's prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9, if you were to compare, it's a confession of the sins of the people. In verses 5 and 6 of Ezra chapter 9, Ezra looks back at Israel's sins and he confesses them. He admits that the people uh, deserve captivity. Uh, and he says in verse 6 that they're like drowning men and women. He says, verse 6, I'm too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Listen to what he says in verse 8, though. He says in verse 8, but now for a brief moment, this is, this is great, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. You know, so the Hebrew word uh, that's translated as a firm place, it is, it's a noun. It literally means a peg for hanging. And, and so what does that mean? Well, there's a sense in which the, the future hung on their testimony. Uh, they were elected, they were the chosen people of God to be a witness to all the surrounding nations, and they failed in the covenant, is what we find. And so there's a sense in which, you know, we're gathered here, of course, uh, and the future of God's witness hangs on us, in a sense. You know, in, in verse 9 uh, of Ezra chapter 9, Ezra says, Though we're slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in sight of the kings of Persia. He's granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he's given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. So this is great because the wall does not refer to the one that, Jerem, uh, that Nehemiah would build. Uh, the remnant would be protected. Absolutely, yes. But they too would serve as a wall against all those awful uh, encroaches of sin. Uh, you know, we're the church. We're God's last line of defense, you know, and it's kind of strange to consider that. But, you know, your witness in, 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 in this town, 
your witness in, in, in school, your, you know, your, your witness in, in your workplace, uh, you, you know, your witness in your family, your witness in your neighborhood and in your community could be God's last line of defense. That is not to say, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying there, you know, God doesn't need us. God doesn't need anyone. He's God. You know, when I, you know, but we can make the change. We can turn the tide. You know, we're God's people. You know, you know, well, look, no sooner had Ezra preached the word of God than it began to reveal sin. I mean, the word of God we know is living and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirits, the joints and the marrow, uh, discerning the thoughts and the intents of hearts and men, the word of God tells us, right? So, but, but let's picture it. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands, I don't know, but thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people converging on the city of Jerusalem, fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, farmers, city officials, politicians, all of them gathering together. And Ezra the priest, he stands on this high wooden platform. He opens the book of the law and Ezra reads the law aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square, as he faced this assembly, right? And, and many couldn't understand what was being read at all and they didn't even know the language, but as Ezra, Ezra read, a group of Levites instructed the people in the law as they were standing there. What a picture. That's, that's, that's this wonderful, awesome picture that we get. And when they finished, we read in Nehemiah that Ezra praised the Lord, that great God. And then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. All right, and as Ezra prayed in verse 5, don't you think he fall to his knees? Oh, absolutely, you know, because nobody can stand before God, no one, you know. Uh, later on, we read the people engaged in this public humiliation, this putting away of their sins, the seeking of the Lord with all their hearts. Um, but then, of course, it always has to come back to what are we going to do? Uh, with that message from God. Um, so as we, uh, as we close this morning, just a few things to think about. If, uh, if God's spoken to us this morning, um, it, it might be that part of that was just to reveal some sin and just the recognition that we need to, again, repent of that sin and just and turn to him again. Uh, you know, that's between, that's between you and the Lord. Uh, he knows your heart, uh, and he knows mine. Um, but if, and it may be the case that God's kind of given us, hopefully this morning, at least the, the eyes of our hearts, allowing them to be open to see this uh, vision uh, of revival. Um, you know, it, it could be the case, I hope it's the case, we should be trembling in a sense before the word of the Lord, you know, because if we are, that means that we're starting to experience that burden for King City, right? That burden for Pine Canyon, you know, and there should be a burden upon our hearts for, you know, for this community and for this county and for this state and for this country and for this continent and, and of course, this world. Um, and it's, you know, it's that point where we were able to come to the Lord and, and just able to say, Lord, you know, I'm going to take this burden. The harder part is to say, I'll make the sacrifice, whatever that is, whatever that it'll cost us. It'll cost us something. But, you know, whatever small or, or great thing that, you know, he wants us to do, uh, just saying that we'll do it in obedience to him. And that's not easy at times, but... Uh, but I believe by the power of the Spirit that, that we can do that individually as believers uh, and then come together again as the church and see what amazing and, and new things uh, he has planned and purposed for us. Um, whether, we're a, whether we're a great assembly or a small one uh, like we are, uh, no matter if we're in times of great celebration and joy or, 
or times of grief uh, and times of sorrow and, and trouble and trials, we always know that God's still working. He's always moving. He's always doing something. All right? He never stops, uh, even at times when it appears to be so. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll wrap this up this morning. Uh, Lord, thanks again uh, for, your, for your word uh, to our hearts this morning. Um, I just, you know, we, we just really need, Lord, that our, our spirits, you know, renewed and, and restored. We, we need that revival, Lord, in our hearts, but we understand that we need to, you know, we need to turn away from those the sins that would be that would be obstacles, Lord. We need to repent, and uh, we need to do that daily, Lord. We need your filling of the Spirit daily. Um, you know, just just recognizing that you know we might fall and, and we might fail from time to time, but you are a God. You, you just love us, and you're always you have your arms outstretched, waiting for us to come back. Um, Lord, I, I, I don't want, I, I would hope that none of us move so far away, though, that we, you know, that we truly uh, you know, lack that understanding, uh, you know, or so much so that you don't recognize us a, as your own. Um, we don't want that to be the case at all, Lord. We, uh, more, we just want to have that vision of, of revival in our lives and you know in, in the lives of our neighbors and in this community and uh, you know we, we really know that you can we believe that you can make changes in people's hearts because we've experienced it in our own hearts and uh, so I pray that we would as your people um, have that renewal have that restoration and that revival so that we can keep on uh, doing uh, your good work, Lord. And we, we want to preach with passion. We just want to tell people about you and how amazing and how awesome you are. And uh, would your spirit just give us the burden to do so and, would it, and the power and the courage uh, to do so um, so that we might see lives changed for your glory. For your honor, Lord, um, you know, we don't, Lord, we don't, we, we don't seek, we don't seek these empty chairs to be filled for the, you know, for the sake of, you know, uh, for the sake of our glory. We just want people to hear about you. We just want people to know more of you. We just want people to be nearer and closer to you, Lord, and Oh, may that be. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we just give all of this to you today, knowing that you'll be with us not only the rest of this day, but in these days that follow, and we thank you for it. Thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, may, we, uh, may we certainly apply it to our hearts as we go forward this day. Uh, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for loving us as you do. Uh, Jesus' name. Amen.